Mr. Fergus, that again raises serious questions about your judgment. Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. Today, the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs, or PROC, convened to discuss Greg Fergus and his behavior last week, which led to him losing the confidence of over half of the House of Commons. The committee's task was to investigate what happened and make a re- recommendation to the House as to what next steps should be taken. Let's take a look. The committee is meeting today to study the question of privilege related to the Speaker's public participation at an Ontario Liberal Party convention. Six minutes to you, Mr. Cooper, through the Chair. Uh, Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses. I'll direct my questions to Mr. Jantz. Uh, Mr. Jantz, are you aware of any precedent, whether it be in Ottawa, the provinces, or across the Commonwealth, where a speaker has engaged in a public display of partisanship of the kind that we saw on the part of Mr. Fergus? Uh, Through you, Madam Chair, thank you for the question, Mr. Cooper. Uh, Again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, there have uh, been certain cases in uh, both the Canadian, some of the Canadian legislatures in which there were questions raised about the uh, activities of of, of speakers outside of, of, of the House. Uh, for the most part, these were addressed via a substantive motion and not via question of privilege studied by a committee. Um, so there are examples, but perhaps not identical to, to the Are you able to, to cite any examples? Uh, well, I, again, uh, there was the, the case in uh, Prince Edward Island where there were questions uh, about the impartiality of, of the speaker, although I think that might have been more related to uh, the speaker's actions in the chamber, not necessarily outside. Um, I don't know if my colleagues can help me out in terms of some of the others. Uh, uh, we, we did sort of canvas our provincial colleagues. There was a case in Nova Scotia, for example, the uh, speaker appeared in an ad for, for their political party, um, as, along with other members of their caucus, um, and that may have given rise to some questions. So there have occasionally been sorts of comments like that about what speakers do, uh, whether attending uh, party <laughs> events or appearing in party Uh, materials. Thank you. Uh, Did Mr. Fergus consult you, Mr. Jantz, about the appropriateness of recording a video tribute to his Liberal friend, John Fraser? Um, Maybe just in terms of a bit of context, obviously myself and the entire House administration are available to provide advice and support to not only the Speaker but to all members. Uh, The Speaker also, of course, has his own staff uh, that he can uh, reply upon for uh, advice. We, the House Administration, myself, provide mainly advice on procedural and administrative matters. Uh, The Speaker's office would perhaps be better positioned to provide advice to the Speaker on more partisan or party matters. But to answer directly your question, Mr. Cooper, no, I was not consulted. Okay, so um, we let that run for a little bit there. so if you're wondering who these guys are, um, the deputy clerk and, and the acting clerk, uh, well, acting deputy clerk and acting clerk. Um, so these guys, they're not members of parliament. Uh, so that's number one. So they're not elected. Um, but what their job is, is they work for the speaker and they work to advise him. Um, they help him. And, you know, these are also the guys that are at the table um, when there's any questions about procedure or anything like that. These are the guys that quickly look it up or they know the answer off the top of their head because that's their job to know this stuff and they help the House of Commons run smoothly. So the interesting thing here is um, Cooper asked a couple of questions. Number one, he asked, is there any, has there any, has there ever been any event like this where a speaker has essentially done anything similar? Because this was pretty egregious in terms of the um, infringing on the nonpartisan nature of the office to essentially record a video in the speaker's robes, in the speaker's office, and have that played at a liberal convention or take the liberal out of it, at the convention of the party that the speaker belongs to. 
So it's unprecedented. It's never happened before. Um, there's some minor similar um, situations that will be brought up at the provincial level, but there's nothing that comes close to this. And the second thing he asked is, did the speaker ask you if he should record this video? Did he seek your advice? And the answer was no. That should have happened because these are the guys to ask. Because as he said, well, you know, we helped the speaker, you know, regarding procedure and everything like that. Well, that would be something to understand from a procedure perspective. Yeah, so there's a small section here on the rcommons.ca website. It says roles and responsibilities of the clerk. Members are supported in their parliamentary functions by services administered by the clerk of the house who, as the chief executive of the house administration, reports to the speaker. The clerk advises the speaker and all members on the interpretation of parliamentary rules, precedents, and practices. His advice was not sought, therefore he could not provide any advice. Yes. So more questions to come, but this is just laying the land for you guys. And when did you first become aware of uh, Mr. Fergus's tribute? Video? I think it was the Saturday via a tweet from, actually, I believe it was you, Mr. Shear, uh, and that led then to some exchanges between myself and the Speaker's office. And uh, had Mr. Fergus sought your advice, what advice would you have provided him? Uh, Thank you again to you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Cooper, I think my advice would have been to probably not proceed in this manner or at a minimum to perhaps canvas the parties and to explain that uh, the speaker's been invited to this event and that he's maybe wondering what he should do and perhaps seek the advice from the parties as to whether or not he should proceed. Very important question. Absolutely. Should the speaker have sought your advice, what would you have said? And let's just simplify this. He would have said, don't do the video. And if you want to do a video, make sure that all of the party leads know that you want to do it and get their input on it. That way everybody knows. And then if something happened like Greg Fergus said it happened, oh, well, you know, it was played somewhere where it shouldn't have been and all this stuff. Um, he at least wouldn't have been in a speaker garb. And two, at least everyone would have known. So uh, there would have been a shared responsibility there. Um, and we wouldn't even be talking about this. So this just goes to show you have people, the liberals have people that work for them, smart people. And when they're not allowed to do their jobs because the liberals just think, well, I know better than everybody, then this is what happens. Well, and the thing is, the clerk doesn't work just for the liberals. They work for all the parties in the House. Absolutely. So that's why Jansen was uh, speaking with Mr. Shear about this event, because Mr. Shear saw it, heard about it, and was like, hey, is this allowed? As, as is his right, because the clerk works for everybody. Yeah, like anyone can, can call up the clerk and, and request a uh, question about procedure because that's what they're there for, right? And technically, the speaker is supposed to be serving everybody, not supposed to be serving a party. That's the whole definition of this office being nonpartisan. They serve every single MP in the House, whether they're an independent or the governing party. And can you elaborate on why you likely would have advised him not to proceed? I think, again, in our, in our parliamentary uh, tradition, uh, it, it, again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, there's a bit of a tightrope that the Speaker has to, to walk in terms of uh, still being a card-carrying member of a party uh, and still the importance of being neutral and nonpartisan in, in terms of presiding over the House and the Board of Internal Economy and the like, and that perhaps this was going a bit too far into the partisan sphere. So he would have crossed a line. Is that fair? I mean, ultimately, I think that's for this committee uh, to determine. Uh, but my advice would have been to to not see the speaker participate in this video. So he uh, he tried very carefully not to say that he crossed a line because that's something that the Conservatives would have then brought back to the House or brought into the discussion at committee. Uh, that no, the clerk said he crossed the line. He crossed the line, and and that's it. So they would use it as justification uh, of their argument for the speaker to resign, no doubt. Um, so Mr. Jantz 
tried very carefully to, to navigate that. I don't think he successfully navigated that because if your main point is I wouldn't have recommended that he do the video, let's reword that into what you know we all know he's meaning. I would tell him not to do the video. Well, I think Mr. Jance had to give an honest testimony, but um, I think he was just trying to prevent himself from going partisan one way or the other. Yep. Um, because again, this gentleman works for all members of the House. He's not a member of Parliament himself, but he works for them and with them. And he has to maintain his nonpartisanship just so that he can serve everyone equally. Yep, as, as much as possible, as much as possible. But when he, when he turns around and says, I, I would tell him not to record the video, well, it means if he did, then the line was crossed. At the table offer chair occupants, including the speaker, briefings or advice about aspects of the roles and responsibilities upon your election? It's actually a very good question. It's one of the things we've been reflecting upon over the last few days in terms of lessons learned. We, of course, do, whenever a new speaker is elected, provide both a written briefing material as well as uh, oral briefings uh, to, to the speaker and to the speaker's staff. Uh, it's perhaps something we should add a larger section on uh, in that briefing material on uh, the role of impartiality. So, uh, written and oral materials are provided and briefings to the speaker, to his staff, and I presume that those briefings would include informing the speaker about his or her duty to be nonpartisan. Again, I think lessons learned, that's probably something we could uh, focus more on going, going forward. Uh, again, it's easy to say looking back. I don't think there's been a whole lot of issues in, in, in the past. Uh, but generally speaking, yes, there, there is obviously a transition that has to be made when one becomes speaker. All right. So this is very important because what Cooper is trying to establish here is a foundation for an argument that Greg Fergus should have known better. And just from the perspective of the fact that he is questioning Jantz on the fact that when speakers get elected, they are provided guidance, they're provided briefings. This is your job. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. And this is what you need to be careful of in your new role. That's basically what, what Cooper is questioning Jantz on. And Jantz is saying, well, yes, we do all of that. And um, yes, we do provide some information and briefing briefings upon their position being nonpartisan. However, um, looking back on it, you know, we could, we could do a better job of that. Now, the important thing that Jantz said there is, we haven't had a lot of issues in the past. And that's important because Greg Fergus is the 38th speaker of the house. The speakers go all the way back to 1867 where James Cockburn, that's his name, uh, was the first uh, Speaker of the House. Conservative, ironically. So you've, you have had people, 37 people prior to him as Speaker of the House, and you haven't had many issues of this. And it's only now that you say, well, you know, maybe we should actually tell them, maybe, which would be much more concise and, and clear as to the fact that they should remain nonpartisan. We should be giving them the kid glove treatment and handling them very carefully and telling them, you know, you're not allowed to do this and you're not allowed to do that. Like, Fergus is an adult. He should know. Anything partisan is out. Well, and I would like to know, if the guy that's in the chair doesn't know that this was partisan, then how did all the conservatives, all the NDP, and all of the, all of the bloc understand that this wasn't okay. Well, and I'll bet you that all the liberals know it's not okay either, and they're just trying to cover for their guy. Well, the interesting thing is, is the liberals had no choice but to agree to the vote that actually sent this investigation to committee in the first place. It was actually sent by unanimous consent. So the liberals had no choice. So this is where we are. So yes, Fergus should have known better. 
just on the mer merits of him being briefed by the staff. Now, he's been around politics for a long time. And he's been in the House for a long time. He's served on committee. He absolutely knows better. And this is going to be a very tough argument to win um, if you're the Liberals. And, and so ha have there been any such briefings, yes or no? There were certainly briefings when uh, Speaker Fergus became Speaker. And how many would he have received? Uh, and I, again, specific to being nonpartisan, right. et cetera. Yeah, no, there, there wouldn't have been a specific briefing on just that subject. It would have been... But it would have included that subject, right? I, I'm sure we would have touched on it, but again, probably not in as much detail as, as we will be yeah. doing for okay. going forward. Uh, with regards to Mr. Fergus's trip to Washington, D.C. <clears throat> last week, was that trip booked through the International Interparliamentary Affairs Unit? It was. It was. And when was it booked? Oof. Uh, it's been in the works for, for some time, uh, but I don't know exactly when. Is some time a few weeks since he was elected Speaker, before yes. he was elected Speaker? Yeah. yeah. Before he was elected Speaker? No, not, sorry, not before. No, no, no. Uh, because it was a Speaker-led trip, so it would have been after he became Speaker. So it's interesting about the Washington trip. They're going to get into this a bit more. There's some interesting details that end up coming out of this. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Merci. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much uh, to our witnesses, Mr. Jantz and Mr. Bidar. Thank you very much for coming this morning. This is indeed a motion that was passed in the House that deals with a serious area in judgment uh, that undermines the confidence of the House in its Speaker. This is indeed something very serious. I would urge this committee to take this very seriously, and that is why we asked you to appear today. Mr. Jans, you said that if you had been consulted, you would have said, no, that's going too far, you mustn't proceed in this manner. If you were consulted after Saturday night, after the video uh, was broadcast, uh, was there contact from the Speaker's office, from Speaker's staff, from the Speaker himself, asking for advice? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I thank you for the question, Mr. Julian. Uh, there were some exchanges uh, starting that weekend between myself and, and, and the Speaker's office uh, in terms of what, what next, uh, which in led then in, in large part to the Speaker's uh, statement uh, on the Monday morning when the House opened. Uh, so it was about the, the, the framing of the apology or the framing of the response, or was it a uh, after the fact? Um, request for what the precedence is uh, around impartiality and nonpartisanship? Uh, the, the discussion was largely focused on next steps uh, with the suggestion that if the Speaker uh, so desired, could make a statement at the opening of the, of the House. Would you be willing to uh, share those emails with the committee today? <laughs> if this committee directs us to do so, we, we, we certainly could. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, oral and written briefings. Um, the written briefing in, in how it uh, touches on nonpartisanship and impartiality, uh, what is specifically shared with the speaker uh, when, when the new speaker came in? Uh, again, as mentioned in uh, response to earlier questions, I think that's a lesson learned for us. Uh, I don't think there's much in terms of uh, discussion text on impartiality of the speaker in the written briefing material that we provide. Uh, it's never really been an issue in, in, in the past, but certainly going forward, I think we will be beefing up that, that section. Um, so, no, it was pretty minimal. Uh, would you be willing to share the written briefing to the speaker with the committee today? I say today because uh, the timelines are very short, as, as I know you're aware. Would you be willing sure. to share those yeah. briefing? Thank you. Uh, thirdly, the, the Washington trip, was it scheduled under the former Speaker Rhoda? Uh, no, this was a trip that uh, the current Speaker uh, initiated upon becoming Speaker. Uh, I understand he had already uh, hoped or planned to go to Washington uh, and uh, then uh, made it into an official uh, IIA-led exchanges visit. Isn't that interesting? So he was already planning to go to Washington, I'm presuming for the express purpose of discussing his friend Klaus Gramkow. That's correct. 
and then made it into a speaker's trip. That's correct. On the taxpayer's dime, presumably. That's correct. Wow. Now, I think he was going to try to to go as an MP and still speak at that. But it, if he was, that shouldn't have been paid by the taxpayer dime because that's a personal, it's a personal trip. Yeah, he, he can say, well, I'm going as an MP, you know, give me a break. You're, you're, you're not going to serve Canadians. You're, you're going to, to talk about your friend at a party. So what he did is he said, oh, now I can, now I can make this a speaker's trip. Let's add some stuff to the uh, agenda. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go on the taxpayer dime. Absolutely. So when that trip was initiated, uh, how soon after the speaker's election? It was election? pretty uh, quickly after the speaker's election that he mentioned it uh, to us that he would like to go to Washington uh, during those dates and that then put into uh, motion the preparation of, of the trip in question. Almost as soon as he became speaker, he initiated this trip. Well, I mean, to be fair, he only became speaker two months ago and... It's possible he will be the shortest serving speaker in Canadian history. Right. But as, as any of us know, right, if you have something planned and you get an unexpected, amazing job offer that you decide to take, are you going to immediately say, oh, but by the way, guys, yeah, now that I have the job, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bouncing in... In, in, in another month or so, because I have a personal trip uh, uh, planned. But uh, I'd like to take that as a business trip too. So can we just add add my work to that, please? Like no. the entitlement. Right. Like no way in heck would any reasonable person do that. Because you would say, well, well no, I can't do that. I got to do my job. And then you say, sucks to be me. I, ca I can't go on that trip. Like, you don't do that. And there's other reasons you don't do that, specifically as the Speaker of the House, which they'll get into. So within days? Days or I'd say within two weeks maximum, probably, uh, we were made aware of the Speaker's desire to go to Washington. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you, you've cited the precedents around Nova Scotia, uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, also uh, the Code of Conduct uh, in the Yukon, uh, Yukon Territory. Uh, when, within the examples you've cited with Nova Scotia and, and PEI, what were the remedies or consequences, remedies in terms of ensuring nonpartisanship and impartiality, uh, or consequences of a speaker uh, violated uh, those uh, fundamental princ principles of impartiality and nonpartisanship? Uh, again, we'll be distributing this material further to the request from uh, Ms. Romanato in the um, Prince Edward Island example, they, uh, their committee, equivalent to your committee, adopted a, a resolution or recommendation that uh, speakers should abstain from partisan activity, including caucus attendance, 60 days prior to the commencement of a session and 30 days after. So that was the recommendation in their report. Uh, Yukon, they had prepared a memo that went on uh, for some length in terms of outlining uh, certain things speakers should not and uh, should do, shouldn't do. For example, there's one publications of the speaker's party in caucus should not include photographs of the speaker in the speaker's robes. But again, we will uh, circulate those documents. Uh, right there. Right there. Photographs should not include the speaker in his robes. Are you going to tell me that Greg Fergus could not determine the difference between like a photograph and go, oh, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't do a video either? Yeah, I think everybody like, understands of uh, um, like a video is a whole bunch of photographs. <laughs> like, <laughs> they used to call them moving pictures. They sure did. So, like, come on. Now, the, the good thing here, um, and, you know, we're trying to be as objective as we can. Um, Peter Julian's actually doing a really good job here. Um, and watch, watch his facial expressions and watch his body language throughout the hearing. He's, he's not happy with what he's hearing, especially if you go back and, and watch that segment on, on the Washington trip, he doesn't like that at all. And nor should he, nor should any of the MPs or any Canadians. So just keep an eye on him. Um, we're not going to be showing you, uh, every single person talking, but he, he is one we're going to be showing because the NDP, 
their their vote on the recommendation as it uh, comes out of committee is critical. But what are the penalties for transgression? If a, if a speaker is photographed in their robes and that uh, that photograph is is connected to a partisan event, what are the consequences or the remedies to that, either in Nova Scotia or Prince Edward Island or, or Yukon? I'll ask my colleague Jeffrey to respond. In some of the cases we've, we've seen, we asked our provincial colleagues what sort of happens uh, if concerns have been raised. And in some cases, there have been motions brought forward um, condemning the Speaker's action or expressing non-confidence in the Speaker in some of those legislatures. Um, I don't believe there were any cases where those motions were adopted. In some cases, they... Um, Speaker may have apologized and that settled the matter. In other cases, the motions were just never completed or they were voted down. Uh, but those are usually the way that those things have been handled. In all of these cases, were these majority legislatures or minority legislatures? I don't know that off the top of my head, sir. Very important question there, if you didn't catch that. Sounds like kind of a minor one. So what the um, what Julian's initial question was is, what was the penalty, basically, for these speakers in these examples where they violated protocol? And there wasn't really a good answer. Um, the only answer that was really provided is, oh, well, you know, the speaker apologized in some cases. And in some cases, there was, there was votes for, uh, to force the speaker to resign. And what, what followed that was um, the completion of that answer being that, well, you know, none of these, you know, None of these motions passed because either the speaker did apologize or the, the motions were defeated. And that's where the really important question comes in from Julian, where he says, were these majority governments? Because if they were majority governments... It would have been their speaker. It would have been their speaker yeah. and they would have defeated the motion easily, right? So they would have been protecting their guy. 100%. So now you have minority government. And so therefore, is, does the precedent apply? No. So it's very interesting that Julian is asking that. If if he was just going to attend committee and say, no, we're, we're, we're going to support uh, Fergus sitting there, I don't think he'd be asking these questions. Do you? Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to our witnesses. Thank you for being here. I want to follow up with some questions on the Washington, D.C. trip. You had mentioned the trip was booked through the International and Interparliamentary Affairs Unit. Um, usually when the Speaker travels, there's a delegation of MPs, one from each recognized party that would go. Was that done? And if not, why not? Uh, thank you for the question um, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Duncan, you're, you're right. Uh, often when speakers go on uh, delegations or on official visits, they will bring a delegation composed of uh, members, uh, representatives from each of the parties. Uh, that's not always done. Uh, we've seen, for example, uh, past speakers go on shorter trips, for instance, to one of their provincial, visit one of their provincial counterparts, and that would not Do we know include. why the decision was made in this case not to? I've Probably because of the, the length of the visit, but it's maybe a question for the speaker at, at 9.30. Uh, That's not good that he doesn't know the answer to that question, by the way. Well, and it's not good that it happened in that manner, uh, meaning that there were no delegates. Right. It seems really shady. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, and as he said, well, it's not always done, you know, when they go and see the other speakers, you know, their other problem says, okay, well, that's fine. You know, that's a speaker to speaker visit. That's... That's not an international affair, right? When you when you're literally going to another country, there's always a contingent of MPs from the major parties. So there should have been a Conservative MP, a Liberal MP, a Bloc MP, and an NDP MP, but there was not. Why? Because. Fergus was just going down there to party. Did Mr. Fergus take any staff from the IIA unit with him? Washington, no. Is that not unusual for a speaker traveling abroad on a trip like that to have staff from the IIA? Uh, again, if it's a longer, perhaps more complicated trip with uh, more meetings, then absolutely we, we send one of our exchanges officers. Uh, again, if it's a smaller, shorter trip, again, either within Canada or uh, in cases like this to Washington, it, it, it's not unusual. Who accompanied Mr. Fergus in Washington, D.C. then? I believe it was his chief of staff and his uh, director of events. 
Uh, does the uh, International and Interparliamentary Affairs Unit have a copy of Mr. Fergus's Washington itinerary? Yes, because they would have been very involved in preparing it. Would you be able to table that with the committee, the uh, details of that agenda? The, the official program, you yeah. mean? Uh, again, if it's the direction from this committee, we, we, can, we can produce that. That would, uh, that would be appreciated. Did Mr. Fergus meet with his counterpart, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, while in Washington, D.C.? I believe it did happen at the last minute. It wasn't confirmed when the Speaker was leaving, but <clears throat> I believe that uh, meeting did happen. Finally, yeah. Is it unusual for a speaker to travel abroad during a sitting week? Uh, unusual, but not completely unprecedented. And it would would note about kind of why why the decision was made for last week and planned for last week for those dates. And the reason I say that is, in January, when our house is not sitting and the U.S. House is in session there, there's several weeks in January that would not have provided a conflict to be there. Was there any discussion about? moving that to January or a time when the House was not sitting? Uh, I don't know how much discussion there was because I think there was an event uh, that the Speaker had already planned on attending, so the idea was to build the visit uh, around that. But again, those are perhaps questions better put to the Speaker at 9.30. There you go. Wow. So pretty much that he did definitely plan this trip around that particular event for his friend, Mr. Graham Cow. And he skipped out of work. His job is literally <laughs> to maintain order in the House of Commons. You have Parliament ending in four days. And then they're off until January 29th. So the question is, well, why, why did he go during a sitting week? Come on. That's your job. That, you have one job, as the saying goes. You have one job. Could you imagine having a job that pays you almost $300,000 a year and that you could say, you know what, I'm going to skip out on work, work. I'm going to play hooky. I'm going to go to a different country and hang out with my friend for a party. That's what happened here. Right. You've only been in, in the job for a couple of months. And then you say to the deputy speakers that have been here, there for years, um, thanks, guys. You're going to take one on the chin for me. Like, do you think? Never mind. Never mind the respect of the house. Do you think he earned any respect from the deputy speakers? I don't think so. Like, come on, man. This guy is is treating his position like it's a a, a bank vault that he's just drawing down from. Oh, I'm speaker. I'm important. Uh, and w won't I look so cool going down to Washington to this event? when I'm talking about my buddy. But honestly, did we expect any better from him? Nope. No. Nope. The, Mr. Fergus attended a retirement party of some sort in Washington, D.C. for uh, a Klaus Graham cow. Uh, were you aware of the speaker's attendance as part of the itinerary for that trip? Yes. Uh, the comments, you saw the video, the excerpt of the comments he made at that party? Uh, and I'll just remind that he was speaking about his history once again in a partisan fashion, about his time as president of the Young Liberals and uh, his election and how he was going to win that election back in that day and sharing how uh, Mr. Graham Cow was connected and all that. Um, you mentioned the video was inappropriate in his role as speaker. I would assume that his comments on a speaker delegation to Washington, D.C., speaking at a, an event, public or a video, would be inappropriate. Would you say that's another inappropriate comment made by the speaker on this trip? Decision, Mr. Duncan, I, I didn't say that the video was inappropriate. I said that I would have advised not to do the video. Just maybe a little yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll reword my question to say you said he should not have done it. Would your advice been knowing this, that he should have not made these comments uh, at the event as well? I, I think that's a fair remark, yeah. I think that's a fair remark. So yeah, um, I would advise him, no, don't be going down to Washington, D.C. and mouthing off and doing exactly what you did in that video, except in a different country. Probably would have advised against that. You think? Not exactly appropriate. And all on our dime, by the way. So if I were just to conclude on this, you've said that it would not, if your advice and knowing ahead of time, you would have advised him not to make the video to the Ontario Liberal Party convention. Would you have advised him not to make the comments that he'd made in his interview with the Globe and Mail, where he cited the Ontario Liberal Party as our party? Would you have advised him not to do that or to say that? Again, normally we're not 
sought for advice in terms of political or party uh, events. Uh, so, again, I've never really been sought counsel on, on a question like that. It's, it's really hard to answer, to be perfectly honest, Mr. Duncan. And do you know why he's never been asked before? Because yeah, it's never happened before. Because it never happened, because speakers aren't stupid. Like, all the other speakers, including Rhoda, they understood, okay, well, I, I can't be partisan here. It's part of the job. Can't do it. So, like, say what you want about Rhoda, but he didn't run around to liberal events, and he didn't run around the world talking about how great the liberals are. He didn't do it. No, the only thing I've ever heard him say, and it's not partisan, but the only thing I've ever really heard him say was he would refer to his writing and how proud he was of his writing and the people in his writing, and the people from his writing. Like, it, it was always about... The people. He, yeah. And that's fine. That's fine. Because he wasn't talking about the party. He was talking about the people. But he wasn't like this, nor were the other speakers. Uh, like, there was there was a few instances, but nothing like this. That's why nobody knows what to do here. Because it's unprecedented. Bingo. And I think what I would say there where I'm going is, is not only the advice to say to not partake in the video, to partake in Washington, D.C. at this retirement party to go and speak in a partisan fashion about his history with the young liberals of Canada uh, and so forth there. And again, the advice not to engage in partisan by referring to our party, the Ontario Liberal Party. Um, just wanted to make sure we were on the record for all three of those uh, challenges. Thank you. Ms. Jens? I know that this is unprecedented. We don't have any examples to draw from. But when Mr. Scheer spent $3,000 to the Guelph riding in 2011, did uh, Mr. Scheer get sanctioned? I don't remember that. We aren't aware of any sanction that was imposed on Mr. Scheer. Are you aware of that situation? That there was a transfer of $3,000 to the Guelph riding during the election to the office of Mr. Scheer while he was Speaker of the House? Uh, personally, no, says Mr. Jansen. No, I'm not aware of that either. You're not aware of the fact that it was uh, for a robocall? Well, if you have any documents pertaining to that, would it be possible to send them to this uh, committee so that we can append those to the report? So that that could help us make our decision. Gotta love the Liberals, eh? It's always whataboutism with them. So... What this gentleman is trying to say, he's trying to paint Andrew Shear because Andrew Shear is sitting in committee, by the way, right across from these guys. He's going to be speaking later. He's trying to say that, oh, well, Andrew Shear, he did something bad and he wasn't sanctioned. So therefore, Greg Fergus shouldn't be sanctioned, you know, when he did something bad. Tit for tat. That's basically what he's saying. Now, what happened here? What he's referring to is... In the 2011 election, we found this in a news article from the Guelph Mercury. Elections Canada records show just days before the 2011 election, Andrew Shear's Regina Capel Riding Association in Saskatchewan transferred $3,000 to Burke's campaign. This guy tried to imply that the $3,000 was transferred from the Speaker's office. That is incorrect. It was transferred from the Electoral District Association. So Scheer may have not even had anything to do with it. It could have been the president of the EDA. It could have been one of the volunteers, one of the staffers. It could have been anybody. Correct, because the MPs don't rule the ridings. There's presidents of ridings and there's there's boards of the ridings. So um, we go on. There is nothing in the funding transfer that is inappropriate according to Elections Canada rules. Elections Canada states that riding associations of the same political party may transfer funds among themselves. Of course, because it's all part of the all, all part of the party coffers. Just as we couldn't get angry if Greg Fergus's riding transferred money to another liberal riding, 
as part of an election campaign because it's not like Greg Fergus transfers the money. It's the writing. So this is nothing to the question, was he issued any sanctions? No, because nothing was inappropriate. Case closed. Elections Canada already decided that. Nice try, though. Mr. Shear, the floor is yours. And Fox, why is Mr. Shear sitting in on committee? Because he's the previous speaker. Bingo. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Fergus, uh, everyone comes to the House of Commons having some involvement in partisan activities. We, we get elected through party nominations and, and in general elections by running under a party banner. Uh, some of us have a greater degree of partisan activities in our background than others, and I just want to quickly go through your background in terms of uh, your partisan involvement. You held uh, a couple of senior executive level type of positions within the Liberal Party itself. Is that correct? I held uh, a senior position. I was the national director of the Liberal Party of Canada at one point, yes. Okay. Which years would that be? Uh, 2007 to 2010. 2010. Okay. So relatively recently. And before that, you were president of the, 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 the was it the youth, the Liberal Youth Wing? or That is correct. Okay. Um, and then upon, and before that, before that, you were, uh, were you were ever involved at the staff level uh, for members of parliament or for cabinet ministers? I had worked uh, in opposition for a federal member of parliament uh, uh, in the constituency office, and I'd also worked uh, in uh, from 1996 to 2000. I'm sorry, it might be 2001 uh, uh, for a federal cabinet minister. Okay, li Liberal cabinet ministers? Yes. Okay. Um, and then upon becoming elected, the path that you chose is a little bit different than other members who are seeking to become chair occupants. Uh, normally, uh, you know, someone might uh, try to shed some of that partisanship in their recent past in order to establish the uh, credentials or the, um, the, uh, the impression of, of being a uh, less partisan or, or a nonpartisan member of parliament to, uh, to present as, as a candidate for speaker, having, uh, in order to assure members of other parties that, that, that you could in fact be nonpartisan. So for example, uh, in my case, I was assistant deputy speaker, then deputy speaker, uh, other, other speakers who have been elected uh, to hold that role have spent time as committee chairs, uh, often uh, in, in roles that are less partisan than what goes on in the House. But upon your election in 2015, you were very, were you immediately uh, nominated as a parliamentary secretary right after 2015? Or was there some? Uh, Madam, uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, aside from uh, your case and perhaps Mr. Rhoda's case, actually, I think uh, most uh, speakers uh, who were elected into the role, as going back to as far as Mr. Fraser, uh, were uh, had a similar path that I had, that in the sense that they hadn't been a, an assistant speaker or a deputy speaker before they assumed the role. Right, but, but there are other ways to establish nonpartisan. Uh, credentials such as committee chairmanships or at least uh, taking a bit of a step back from the cut and thrust of, of the hyper-partisan uh, roles that, that exist in the chamber. And I'm just pointing out that you, you did hold one of those those positions. You were parliamentary secretary right after the 2015 election? I was uh, parliamentary secretary uh, after, par uh, through you, Madam Chair, sorry. Uh, I was parliamentary secretary uh, when I got, when I was nominated parliamentary secretary after getting elected for the first time in 2015. I then uh, was, uh, I was a member of the committee of, uh, member, not a parliamentary secretary, but a member of the finance committee uh, for two years. And then uh, just before the 2019 election, I was reappointed uh, a parliamentary secretary. So typical Greg Fergus, he's saying, oh, well, I didn't, uh, I, uh, yeah, yes, I didn't, you know, take the role of deputy speaker and, and maybe you and Rhoda did, but not too many other people did. So, you know, that's, that's not correct. And she says, well, fine, but my point is not that. My point is, is that most of the other speakers took steps in their career prior to being speaker to demonstrate to everybody that I'm not really partisan. And I'm not really partisan. I'm not participating in those hyper-partisan activities because my goal is to be a speaker. 
Right. For example, could you imagine if right after the conservatives get elected, they appoint Larry Brock as uh, the Speaker of the House? Not going to lie. That'd be awesome. It would be amazing. <laughs> but but you've seen him in committee. You've seen him in in the House of Commons. He's a very he's like a bulldog. He's he's very partisan. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying you want somebody who's a little less partisan as the Speaker of the House. Yeah, so you're not going to get Michael Cooper as Speaker of the House, as ma amazing that would be. You're not going to get Larry Brock, a Speaker of the House, as amazing as that would be. You're not going to get a Michelle Ferrari as, as a Speaker of the House, right? Because uh, we need these hyper-partisan MPs to stand up for their constituents and to stand up for Canadians. And then you also need... MPs that are less partisan to take on these partisan role uh, to take on these nonpartisan roles such as uh, you know chair in committee speaker of the house deputy speaker etc. Yeah, like I'd like to see Kelly McCauley as speaker of the house. Yeah, I, I think he'd do a fantastic job. Yeah, I think he, I think he'd do really well. Parliamentary secretary to the prime minister. At that time, it wasn't parliamentary secretary to the prime minister. It was parliamentary secretary to the minister. Uh, for the president of the Treasury Board and the minister responsible for um, for digital government. Okay, um, but you were parliamentary secretary to the prime minister for for how long? I believe it was from 2020 uh, to uh, this autumn. Okay. Um, so you say that a family friend of Mr. Fraser contacted you. Uh, so it wasn't Mr. Fraser himself; it was a member of his family. No, it wasn't Mr. Fraser itself. It was a member of his family who had contacted uh, my office. It wasn't Mr. Fraser because it was supposed to be a surprise video at a private event. And do you have any? Uh, do you have any copies of correspondence that you could provide to the committee? I'm more than happy to provide uh, uh, this committee uh, with all uh, correspondence, um, a phone record of. Uh, the request that came in to the to the office. You mentioned in your opening remarks that you uh, you, you reference your own comments about being a, an arbiter in the in the chamber. Just asking you to to ask ask yourself if you were involved in a situation that needed an, an arbitrator, and you saw the arbitrator uh, at an event with the person on the other side of the table. Maybe if we imagine a, a, a union negotiation with management or uh, some type of dispute between uh, two parties, and you saw the arbitrator, the the person whose whose uh, hands your case was in, at an event with your opposing counsel or with the opposing <coughs> partner in that situation, um, would you want that arbitrator to continue to hear your case and and to make that decision? After seeing he or she in their full arbitrator's uniform, or at least uh, uh, with with clear signals that that's who that person was at that time, um, saying nice things or 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 it, it being involved in any way with the person on the other side of the table, would you want that person to hear your case, Madam Chair? Am I permitted to respond? Sure. So, uh, Madam Chair, I, I, if I could. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for that question. This has been something that actually has been a bit of an aha moment for me. Uh, Madam Chair, I thought speaking about my, the aha moment came in discussion with a member of the opposition um, when I realized that by talking about my past, I thought it was a value-free statement just recounting the things that I did, such as the questions that Mr. Shear just asked me. But it, the aha moment came when saying that people don't see that when I talk about my past, it's not a value-free statement. They see it as a way as almost making a statement today about my political uh, uh, partiality. And that was not my intention. Uh, I thought I was just talking about the posts and the roles that I held Thank in the you, past Mr. and the Speaker. context in which things were made. Thank Me you, Madam Chair. So in short, I'm not going to answer your question. That's basically what he's saying, because he would have to agree with him. So he's not going to answer the question because he doesn't want to incriminate himself any more than he already has. He already has. <laughs> Can you blame him for that? No. But still, it's it just displays the lack of integrity and the lack of partisanship in his answers. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je me sens très Thank you, Madam Chair. 
This week, there was a crisis surrounding the speakership. It was difficult for everyone. It was difficult for Canadians. And now I feel that uh, we are grappling with something serious pertaining to the speakership, and we all have to reflect seriously about this, because the role of speaker is critical. In this situation, I'm saddened that the House uh, felt compelled to refer, and they referred this, uh, to, this to the PROC committee uh, unanimously because of what they consider to be a serious error. I've been listening very carefully to your uh, testimony, uh, Mr. Fergus, and um, I wanted to know when you realized that this was a serious error. When did you know that it was wrong to have done that video? The very moment I saw that it was, uh, or that it was reported to me that it had been uh, uh, aired publicly, it all of a sudden, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Julian, it became very clear that that was just wrong. That wasn't the intention. Um, it shouldn't have, not only wasn't the intention, but as I said in my testimony, as I say to you again, it should never have been taped in the first place. It, was, it became very clear in hindsight how wrong that was. And that's the reason why I apologize to you, and I apologize to all members, and I'm apologizing to all Canadians. But when you were doing the video, in, in your ropes, in, in, uh, in the House, uh, in, in your Speaker's chambers, what, what was going through your mind? I, and, and I say this uh, with respect. Uh, I, I know as a Member of Parliament that I can't film uh, partisan videos in my constituency office, in my Hill office. We take careful attention to do that. The precedence is vast. We all know that it is wrong. I don't understand what was going through your mind as you were taping it. And did you consult with your chief of staff at any point to say, do you think this is a good idea? This is what I mean when I said, like, watch Julian um, in this in this hearing, because he's genuinely, he's like, <laughs> he has the look of, dude, what's wrong with you? Because I think as MPs, they all understand that this is not okay. And then you have Fergus sitting there going, oh, well, you know, I didn't realize. And, uh, you know, when it was pointed out to me, uh, um, you know, that's when I figured out that uh, it was a bad idea. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry. I apologize to Canadians. Apology rejected. Yeah. And we we didn't bother showing you his apology to committee because, frankly... I'm I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a week and a half too late. The, the the his quote unquote apology happened last Monday, where he said, "Well, you know, um, I'm sorry that people misinterpreted what what it meant." No, that's like the kind of apology that goes, "Oh well, you know, I'm sorry your feelings were hurt." Yeah. Not I'm sorry I did something that hurt your feelings. No, I'm sorry you feel that way. Exactly. So, um, so to Julian's point, and, and it actually references a point I made earlier, where I said that like the the block, the NDP, and and the Conservatives, they all know this was wrong. They're not even in the chair of the Speaker of the House. This guy should have known it's wrong. And you want to talk about precedent again? Thirty-seven other speakers have been in the House. This hasn't really been a problem because they all know better. So now you have one guy who's been in Parliament forever, who's had multiple parliamentary positions as secretary. And let's not forget he had an ethics violation. And he had an ethics violation. So, yeah, we're not surprised, but it's still an outrage. The difficulty uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Julian, um, that was the problem is that it was a very quick uh let's just quickly get this done um and it was not a partisan video it was a very personal video i did talk about my past um but it wasn't one where i was pronouncing about the present or making a, a declaration on that front it was a mistake i shouldn't have done it period 
But when I was making it, it was in the moment. It was between two meetings. We were in a rush. And uh, I, I just did it in one take and moved on uh, to my next meeting. And I, I, I've been playing over this moment in my mind over and over again. I wish I had just taken a moment to think about it. Sometimes in politics, and, and I think we all do this, but it's it's a glaring when it happens to you, and it's embarrassing as as all as all out. Uh, is that sometimes when you do these things, you're not thinking. We move from pillar to post so quickly. We go from one event to another to another. We don't take the time sometimes to just take a step back and think about it. That's why a protocol. Uh, is being put in place to make sure that all communications will be going through uh, a, a, a process that will be uh, using the administration of the House, especially the clerk, to determine whether something is appropriate or not. Everybody does this. We all do this. It's not a big deal. We all do this. You know, it was just such a simple mistake because I was, you know, doing this and that and I wasn't paying attention and blah, 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 blah. Guys, yeah, between meetings. Hey, Jerry, get the camera quickly. Uh, get the lighting. Hey, do I look right? Okay. Oh, it's just such a simple mistake. I shouldn't be held accountable for it. I shouldn't lose my job with a 50% pay raise on the taxpayer's dime for it. I, I'm, I'm troubled by something else as well. In your ap apology to the H House on Monday, December 4th, you said, video was played at a convention for a party that I am not a member of in a province where I do not live in and where I've been <laughs> unable to vote for nearly three decades. But on the Saturday, 48 hours before, the Globe and Mail quoted you as saying, in, in terms of Mr. Fraser, he demonstrated so much calm and conviction and resolve and determination, and he's held it all together at a very challenging time in the history of our party. You referred to our party in the Global Mail on Saturday, who said on Monday uh, that th I'm not a member of this party. It's in a province I do not live in, where I've been unable to vote for nearly three decades. Do you see the contradiction between those two statements? I, I yes. Yes, we do. And it's called trying to distance yourself and... Trying to skirt responsibility. Avoid responsibility. 100%. Yes, we do. We do, and if you had asked me if I if I hadn't taken a look at the transcript uh, of the video, um, uh, I wouldn't have. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have used that word as our party. What I was referring to, in terms of his past, and my past, and where it really connected, was was 30 years ago. Um, J'ai une autre contradiction. Vous venez de dire que. I have another question for you, and I can understand that these were very intense weeks when you were appointed speaker. It was an a period of adaptation. But according to what Mr. Jans said, a few days after you were elected, you started planning a trip to Washington while Parliament was sitting. I see a contradiction there. It was very intense at the end of the session. But you were planning a trip to Washington during the parliamentary session. Could you explain that contradiction? Yes. It was a personal commitment I had made to attend that event. I was intending to do that as a member of parliament on a personal basis. And when I explained that to the team, that I wouldn't be available, and that I had taken steps with the occupants of the chair to replace me during that period. I don't know who had suggested it first, but someone suggested that they could maybe organize some other meetings at the same time. Thank you. Oh, so it was somebody else's idea? Of course. Give me a break. Somebody else came up with the idea that, hey, I can go do a personal trip tack on a little bit of business and bill the Canadian taxpayer. You know, think about what he said. Um, I, I, I don't remember who, who, who said it first, but, but somebody said it. We're at the same thing in the Arrive Can meetings from these, these people at CBSA. Oh, I don't know uh, who, who suggested it. I don't, I don't know who it is. He lies worse than a little kid. He, he lies worse than both Cameron McDonald and Mindone combined. We're going to go into our second round. It'll be Mr. Cooper followed by Mr. Gerritsen, Prima Dame de Belfiore, and Mr. Julian. 
Mr. Cooper, Mr. Cooper, five minutes to you through the chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Fergus, you stated that you <laughs> realized that it was a mistake when it had been aired publicly and that if only you had a moment to reflect on it, you wouldn't have done that. You state, stated that as though the video were done in isolation, except that it wasn't done in isolation because on the evening of December 1st, the day before the Liberal leadership announcement, an interview in the Globe and Mail, written by Laura Stone, was published in which you praised Mr. Fraser and offered partisan comments. Did you think that that interview was going to be in private? No, not at all. Uh, uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, I was being interviewed and I made it again clear in, during that interview that it wasn't wasn't talking about his current place. I was talking about, I, and I, as a matter of fact, if you if we can get the transcripts of it from Ms. Stone, uh, I said very clearly that I can't talk about uh, about political current affairs, but I could certainly talk about the man that I knew. You made including referring to the Liberal Party uh, as our party. Those were your words. You thought it was appropriate to take an interview with Laura Stone in your capacity as Speaker of the House to speak about a sitting MPP who uh, is the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, or was, on the eve of a convention. You thought that that was appropriate as Speaker of the House of Commons. Well, That's why we love Cooper. Yeah, I was going to say, I missed Cooper, and I'm, I'm so happy to be sitting here watching him now. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, we've been Cooperless for a while, um, just because we've had to, uh, to divert, divert our attention to other committees. But he is so matter-of-fact, straight to the point, no BS, just cuts right through everything, and he's got a mind like a steel trap. And yeah. So we've heard he's got a really good memory. So he's just able to, as he just did, just quote what you said. Like, even if it's 15 minutes later, he'll remember it. Yeah, right back to you. So um, and we've been we've been skipping, you know, uh, some some sections here. So uh, it's not like he just made these statements. So this is the this is the thing. You, you're not going to get out of this. And, and how how you think you're going to explain well you know it just it was the video that's all it was no it wasn't the video it was the globe and mail article it was the video and it was the washington trip it's the trifecta three strikes you're out through you madam chair uh, to mr cooper i had had an interview with mr uh, with ms stone to talk about uh, the person who i knew and uh, the person who I had an interaction with and i made it very clear during the interview that it's not to talk about current politics i couldn't do that as speaker uh, well, you did refer to the Liberal Party uh, as our party. And I would submit, Mr. Fergus, with the greatest respect, the fact that you didn't see an issue with that uh, demonstrates or raises questions about your judgment. Now, I do want to drill down on your uh, uh, statement around uh, the video and how that came about. Uh, you said that you were approached by a family member of Mr. Fraser. Who was that family member? Through you, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to provide all the information on this. Uh, a simple question: Who was the family member? May, Madam Chair, uh, I'm, I've been a member of, uh, of Proc, and I know that we've uh, been very careful about uh, uh, revealing the names of, of family members. I'm happy to provide that information, and I will uh, to uh, to the clerk of Proc. When was may, the request may I, made? May, may I ask that uh, the committee? Uh, speak to Mr. Fraser and ask him if it's okay for him to reveal the name of the family member? So I think what, I'm pausing the time for a second, I think what Mr. Cooper has done is move on because we do know that you're undertaking to bring those documents. I will confirm that all members want those documents at the end of your appearance. We still have lots of time with you. But what I hear from Mr. Cooper is that he has moved on asking when um, the request was made. So I feel Mr. Cooper hears what you're saying. I think he has the same regard. So the floor is back yours, Mr. Cooper. When was the request made? Uh, the request was made uh, on Oct um, November uh, 27. November 27? That is correct. Okay. And in your statement to the House on December 4th, uh, you stated that you were asked to record a video to be played at an intimate gathering. What was that intimate gathering? 
It was to be a surprise, through you, Madam Chair, it was to be a surprise uh, goodbye uh, with members of Mr. Uh, Fraser's team uh, to be played on December 1st. To be played at December 1st. And who is Mr. Fraser's team? Who indeed? Remember, the whole premise of his, oh, it was a mistake. It wasn't supposed to be aired, you know, at a partisan event, right? But you just said it's a private gathering with Mr. Frazier's team. I mean, it's not like the man's a surgeon or something. He's a politician. His baseball team, his hockey team, his curling team. Which team? I, I don't know, but I'm assuming it was uh, close folks who had... I been presume you're talking about his political team? I, would that be Mr. Fraser's team? I'm assuming it would comprise part of his political team, but it certainly could be other friends and, uh, and, and family and gathering. Wow, look at Fergus squirm. He's done. He knows he backed himself into a corner. He's done. Cooper's going to get him. Um, I think he was hoping that this question wouldn't be asked. I think he was. I think he was hoping that when he said, "Well, you know, intimate family, intimate gathering," I think what he hoped is that everyone would just assume that's his family, and that's it. But no, no, no. Who was it? So here's the thing. So he just said, "Okay, well, I, I assume it would involve people from his political team." Okay, so that's a problem because that undermines your statement of you didn't know this was going to be pay played at a political event. Bad judgment all over the place, and yet did it anyway. And, and, it, and the event was to be held on December 1st. Where was the event? What location? I, I do not know. You, so you had no idea? I but, do but you knew it was uh, going to be played for Mr. Fraser's team, the number of people there you weren't sure of. And uh, as you indicated, part of that would have been his political team. So Mr. Fergus, that again, raises serious questions about your judgment. And when did you find out that it was played at the Ontario leadership announcement? Uh, did, well, what time before then did you, were you alerted that it would be played? I wasn't alerted at all that it would be played. Indeed, I had received assurances that it wouldn't be played publicly. That this, that- From who? Uh, from the family member. From the family member. And so you mean to tell me you found out at the same time the public found out? Through you, Madam Chair, that is, actually, that is absolutely correct. And uh, you had indicated that a staff member recorded the video in your office. Who was a staff member who recorded the video? Okay. I've asked a simple Ta question. You have asked a simple question. I'm taking by the response and the beep, beep, beep I, that we're not getting that answer, but it sounds... No, no, uh, I'd be happy to provide that answer. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable on, on... Again, it's a tradition of this committee and of this House is that the Member of Parliament is responsible uh, for the actions of uh, his or her staff. I could tell her that it was a staff member. Excellent. And it was so my I'm staff going member to from my Hill office. Minimize, so I think that's kind of where I was getting to, but it does <laughs> sound like you're agreeing to provide the documents. Once again, we will get committee to confirm that we would like those documents um, at a later time. So thank you for that exchange. Very interesting. Very interesting. Fergus is in a lot of trouble. His his main his main point of defense that he was able to kind of rely on up to this point is, well, I you know it's not my fault. I didn't know they were going to take this video and play it for political people. That's basically summarizing what he said. But then he says that he knows. He knows it was going to be played. He knows it was going to be played for Mr. Frazier and his political team and more people. And we're assuming that political team is comprised of liberals. Because he's for sure. a liberal. <laughs> for sure. He's not going to invite, you know, conservatives. Um, the other interesting thing is Cooper, I don't think he believes him. It's pretty obvious he doesn't. I don't believe him. Mean. I don't believe him. <laughs> like, and... Uh, and it's convenient, and I think the reason why he said, "Who's the, fa you know, who was it? Who told you?" He said, "Family member." Well, who was that? You know, he's being a family member gives you certain protection at committee. 
it it reduces the likelihood that you're going to be called in to testify. So it's not very likely that the family member who allegedly asked Fergus for the video is going to be called into committee to testify about what they did or did not say to Mr. Fergus. Well, and the other thing they're asking, you know, who's his family member and as a family member you're not you're not the politician, right? You don't you don't necessarily want to be part of that world. You support your your family member, but you don't necessarily want to be part of it with the media breathing down your neck and you don't want to be called in a committee and all this stuff. So I think there is a certain level of protection that the MPs understand they're, they are to afford the family members. Um, the name, as we heard in committee, will be provided written. They just didn't want to say it. Publicly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. This is this saddening for Canadians. Uh, and I, I need to understand... Uh, both having gone through uh, what what we consider it to be a campaign for, for speakership. And we, we, we have speakers who offer themselves. They all uh, um, talk about the role of the speaker. They talk about impartiality and nonpartisanship. I, I'm interested in your perception of impartiality and nonpartisanship prior to your election and, and what you did... Uh, following that to ensure a full understanding of impartiality and nonpartisanship in terms of precedence. I, I was disturbed by Mr. Jantz's testimony that he, he had not been consulted in any way about the, the filming of the video. And so uh, I, I need to know, and I think Canadians need to know, what, what are the steps that you took after your election to ensure that the, the comments you'd made that were very strong about impartiality and nonpartisanship were kept moving forward. Thank you very much to Mr. Julian for this question. Every action or ruling that I've made, whether it was even from the chair or if it was uh, reflective in, in writing uh, that was taken in the House, was one that was, they were all based on consultation with uh, our uh, clerk's team to making sure that they were uh, neutral, that they were impartial, and that were in the best traditions of the House. Quite often you have seen me uh, stand up at question period and even consult the table to making sure that the decisions that I had were rendered impartial and that they were uh, a reflective, a reflection of uh, the best of our parliamentary traditions. That was always done. Every decision that I made was in that regard. I, I don't understand why you didn't consult the clerk and uh, the legal team that we, we have for the House of Commons around the video. Why did you not do that? Uh, and that is a mistake that is clearly on my, my fault. Uh, I saw this at the time and it, it has taken me to understand how this does not uh, uh, do well. Uh, but I take it at the time that I was making a video, a tribute video to somebody who was leaving a post, someone who had a deep relationship with the past. I'm sorry that I made that video. I acknowledge it's a mistake. And that is why I've set up processes to make sure that that can't happen again. Yeah, well, um, the interesting thing here is there's some really good questions coming out of Peter Julian here. Uh, really good questions. And Fergus didn't answer one of them. And it's a very important one that he didn't answer, which was, you know, all of the speakers were, were you know, through their election campaigns, which is very short, by the way, um, when they're elected Speaker of the House, they, you know, they, they try and convince people why they're going to be a good speaker. And apparently... Uh, or allegedly, Greg Fergus spoke very strongly about nonpartisanship and being very neutral and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so Julian's question was, what did you do after you were elected to try to carry forward your comments and put them into action in terms of demonstrating that neutrality? And all Fergus really said was, well, every ruling I've made in the House of Commons, I've consulted with with the clerks. Well, no, you haven't. Well, and yeah, that's not even true because if you all remember, the thing that got us so upset was that he interrupted question period to give a, a, a thirty minute speech about decorum in the House and kept insisting that that was his right as Speaker. No, it is not. It's laid out in the table. Yeah, 
it like sheer went up during that grabbed the book with the standing orders and procedures for the house of commons opened it to the page and said right here and read it out for the house of commons you do not have the right because I'm sure if he had consulted with the clerk or even just by reading the table himself, he would have come to the conclusion that, no, I'm not supposed to do that. But this guy just seems to do whatever he wants and thinks there's no consequences. Well, and that's the problem, right? Uh, and he thinks, oh, well, you know, I can just say I'm sorry and then move on with it. Um, people aren't having it, Fergus. Even your NDP buddies, they're not having it. They're not accepting that. Like, just look at the face of, of Peter Julian. It's getting smaller and smaller as this hearing goes on. Yeah, it he's is, getting so frustrated. You can see it. He's just like, why? Like, what? What? Why? What? The, like, that's his reaction to this. And that's, that's genuine. And again, if the objective of the NDP was just to help the Liberals get out of this, then he wouldn't be asking these types of questions. Which is another kind of signal of what, you know, might be coming in the spring. We've seen the NDP distancing themselves over time uh, from the Liberals over the last couple of months. Um, anyway, this is the end of part one because this is quite lengthy. Fergus was with them for a long period of the day. Um, but we're not done. And there's some other very curious things that happened in committee. So stay tuned tomorrow when we... Uh, when we release part two. Until then, we'll see you in the comments.